environment, essential to our food supply. But around the world, the honeybee is disappearing. In a matter of days, the adult population totally evacuates the hive, and we presume goes off and dies somewhere. This is an incredible calamity and represents an incredible loss. We're talking maybe a third of bees in the United States have disappeared. That's 800,000 hives of bees. Scientists now race to solve an urgent mystery. Following a trail of clues from the United States to southern France, from the hills of Spain to England, all the way to Australia and China. Unless science can slow the spread of this bizarre epidemic, the honeybee could disappear forever. And with it, a bustling city at dawn. Industrious workers set out from their homes, coming and going in a perfect and productive ballet. But by evening, the workers vanish. No trace of foul play. No bodies left behind. Mass disappearances like this have recently occurred across the globe. Not of humans, but of millions of honeybees. In a matter of a, a month and a day, from the time I set the bee down until I came back, they had disappeared. You go up to a beehive that previously was populous, many bees, thousands of bees, and a few days later, almost all the bees are gone. Beekeepers around the world are warning that a crisis is brewing. A phenomenon dubbed colony collapse disorder has mysteriously emptied beehives in at least 35 states. And from Europe to South America, the bees are disappearing. There is something very different here. And we don't know what to do about it, and we don't know what's causing it. So that's why this problem is really concerning. Estimates are that about 600,000 of America's 2.6 million honeybee colonies may have just disappeared. In some areas of the country, up to 80% of the honeybees have vanished in as little as six months. And for such a small insect, the bees' disappearance could have colossal repercussions for humans. They're tiny creatures, their brain is small, and yet honeybees are the most important pollinator on the planet. They account for about one-third of the food that's produced in America. Honeybees pollinate nearly 100 of our most important crops. Fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, even fibers like cotton. In the United States alone, the value of their services exceeds 15 billion dollars. We rely on this one species to do all this pollination and they're in trouble. Unless we only want to eat corn, wheat and rice, we need bees. Without bees, life as we know it, I don't think will exist. The vanishing bees have spurred the launch of a global investigation with beekeepers and scientists racing against time to answer the question, why are the bees disappearing? Possible suspects include toxic pesticides, parasites, malnutrition, or even an AIDS-like virus sweeping through the insect world. Pressure mounts to find a solution before the planet's premier pollinator is gone for good. We're looking for clues. We're looking for footprints of infection. The terminology that we've used in the past has been it's when CSI meets agriculture. Colony collapse disorder has surprised the public with the realization that the future of our food supply rests on the tiny honeybee. Deploy, Maine. A caravan of semis rolls in at Jasper Wyman Farm, the largest grower of wild blueberries in the country. The drivers have piloted their cargo nonstop from as far away as Florida and California. Now they prepare to unload their shipments of livestock. Small, six-legged livestock.
It's pollination season. And across the northeast, the bees are on the move. Which side? Your side or my side or what? This side, right? <laughs> Every year in May, Pennsylvania beekeeper David Hackenberg brings his bees to Maine for a few weeks' work in the blueberry barrens. 2,600 hives, each brimming with 30,000 bees. He distributes them throughout the farm's 7,000 acres, where the wild blueberry flowers are just beginning to unfold. The bees have traveled a long way and are only halfway through a busy work year. These bees you see here are probably all in, in, in oranges in Florida. Some of them were probably in cantaloupes in Florida. From there, they came to Pennsylvania, pollinated apples, and their next ride came here to Maine to pollinate blueberries. These beehives travel about 5,500 miles a year on the back of the truck. For $90 a hive, David will leave his bees in the barrens for three weeks. During this time, his bees will go to work collecting pollen for their young, and in the process, enabling a new crop of wild blueberries to grow. Without the bees, there would be no fruit to harvest. If we didn't bring bees here to pollinate these blueberries, the blueberry farmer wouldn't have enough berries to have a profitable business. I mean, you would get maybe a couple hundred pounds an acre. We're looking for hundreds and thousands of pounds of blueberries to make it a profitable business. The entire industry depends upon keeping these tiny workhorses healthy. But caring for a stock of over 36 million animals can be a challenge. Everything from weather to local predators poses a danger. In Maine, the irresistible smell of honey brings out another threat to the hives. Bears. Bears. Their homes and pollen stores torn apart. The bees are angry. They're not very happy. Field manager Darren Hammond isn't too pleased either. Every hive destroyed by bears adds to his tab. Hundred dollars a hive. Darren's total bill for renting hives this year will exceed nine hundred thousand dollars. To make sure he's getting his money's worth, he checks the activity on the blossoms. If you take one square meter and you wait one minute and count the number of bees in one square meter per minute, if you have two and a half bees in that square meter, that's adequate pollination. The bees are doing a job they've done for 100 million years since they evolved along with flowering plants and formed a perfect partnership. Bees forage for high-protein pollen in the flowers, and the plants reward them with a sugary liquid called nectar. Some bees develop specialized anatomies to efficiently harvest nectar. Chief among them was Apis mellifera, the honeybee. An architectural marvel, the honeybee's design is an elegant fusion of form and function. A proboscis for ferreting out nectar stored deep in a flower's folds, and powerful mandibles for eating, feeding young, and manipulating wax. Two compound eyes are comprised of 6,900 lenses and covered with sensory hairs for detecting wind speed. Three additional eyes, called ocelli, receive light signals for orientation. Four wings clasp together with tiny hooks and beat up to 230 times a second. For defense, a double-edged serrated sting, which she can use only once at the cost of her own life. Hind legs are broadened into special baskets for carrying heavy cargo of pollen to the hive. Feathery hairs coat the body and build up a static charge as the bee flies. When the bee lands on a flower, pollen literally jumps onto her body. They're just this 
magnificent little engineered thing, just perfect for all the things they can do. And as they go through life and change their tasks, these different anatomies come into play. When a bee transfers pollen from one flower to another, the plant's fertilized ovaries swell into ripened fruit. It is nature's oldest and most fruitful alliance. But today, we rely on bees to perform a natural task on a very unnatural scale. Farmers continue to push for crop yields far larger than anything nature has ever seen. Apples, blueberries, pears, peaches, almonds, as farms devour more and more land, wild insects lose natural habitat, and pollinators have to be trucked in. The whole system only works thanks to a handful of commercial beekeepers who transport their bees around the country, pollinating a third of the food we eat. But the beekeepers are in trouble. Their bees are disappearing. November 2006, David Hackenberg opened his hives to find 70% of his bees had vanished. 400 hives of bees that were good looking hives of bees a month before and most of them were gone. David rushed several dying colonies to Pennsylvania's acting state beekeeper, Dennis Van Engelsdorp. Dennis now monitors a quarantine of several of the collapsing hives. They're infected with a mysterious syndrome that he says is unlike anything we've experienced before. Certainly there's evidence that there have been similar collapses. But the collapse we're seeing right now, I've never seen. When bees become sick, they sacrifice themselves and leave the hive to die to prevent infecting the rest of the colony. But this is a mass evacuation. More and more alarmed beekeepers call, reporting millions of bees disappearing without a trace. Stranger still, the insect raiders that usually invade colonies for honey and pollen leave the hives untouched. Within months, the epidemic reaches truly frightening proportions. If you look at the numbers, we're talking maybe a third of bees in the United States have disappeared. That's 800,000 hives of bees. By early spring, the phenomenon has a name. Colony Collapse Disorder, CCD. A colony has CCD when we see a rapid loss of the adult population. And what we're seeing is just that younger and younger adult bees are leaving the colony to die away from the colony. So this colony is really at its last stages. I would imagine in a week or so, we'll probably only find the queen in this colony surrounded for, by just sort of a mitt full of bees. As CCD wipes out hives across the US, reports of similar mass bee losses pour in from overseas. Bees vanish in Italy, Poland, Portugal, in Central and South America, in Croatia, Beekeepers claim that as many as five million bees disappeared in less than 48 hours. The disappearing of the bees captivates the public as the media prints a parade of speculation about what could be causing the crisis. The first to grab headlines is a story that cell phones are interfering with the bees' navigation. The cell phone theory stemmed from an ambiguous quote in a British paper the guy who did the research in Germany on this cell phone, he actually put just a cordless phone in a, in a colony and rang it. And it was a very badly designed study, and he's retracted all statements. But that really took wings. The next suspect is an old but deadly enemy of the bee, a mite called Varroa destructor, which killed off half the honeybees in the United States in the 1980s. But this time, something is very different with mites you got bees crawling around the ground that the mites have attacked here we didn't have any bees there's no dead bodies out in the ground the bees have flew away disappeared 
it does not appear at this point in time that any one of the known factors could account for colony collapse disorder because we've never seen this magnitude of a loss before. Scientists struggle to understand what could cause such a major collapse of one of the most highly organized and complex societies in the animal kingdom. A healthy hive of honeybees functions like a perfect and fluid organism. At the center of all activity is the queen. An egg-laying machine, the queen is actually a slave to her duties, laying up to 2,500 eggs a day, as many as two million in her lifetime. The worker bees are all female and make up the bulk of the colony. In a typical hive of 30,000 bees, only about 100 are males, called drones. With oversized eyes and bulky bodies, drones are not equipped to gather pollen or nectar and must rely on the workers to feed them. The invaluable work bees do takes its toll. In the summer, workers only live around 30 days, literally worked to death. But the hive is constantly replenished with new generations of bees, ready to go to work from the moment they hatch. When a bee is three weeks old, she becomes a forager and will spend the rest of her short life collecting nectar and pollen. She'll fly up to three miles away and, amazingly, always return to the same hive. When she discovers an abundant pollen source, she'll recruit other foragers through a most unusual form of communication, a dance. She informs the other bees that food is available and that food is in such and such a direction from the hive and is at such and such a distance away from the hive. And those pieces of information, distance and direction, are encoded symbolically in movements and sounds that she produces. Turn right at 100 feet. Take a left at 50 feet. The waggle dance is the only known symbolic language that exists outside the realm of humans and lower primates. There's really nothing that compares to the dance language of the honeybee. It stands as one of the seven wonders of the animal behavior world. With the onset of CCD, there are fewer dances happening in the hives. Foragers are setting out to search for pollen and simply not coming back. The case of the vanishing bees is at the forefront of a much larger crisis. Not just bees, but all pollinating animals have been disappearing for decades. Pollinators across the board have suffered from industrialization, urbanization, disruption of habitats, introduction of invasive species. They're experiencing death by a thousand cuts. Bees and butterflies don't usually make the headlines, but scientists warn that the steady decline in bees and other pollinators could trigger a crisis bigger and more immediate than global warming. Three-fourths of all plants on the planet depend on animals for pollination. They can't reproduce sexually without this animal partnership. So if you look out the window and eliminate three quarters of what you see, that's a reason to worry. As the supply of pollinators keeps dwindling, agriculture pushes for ever bigger harvests. Three years ago, bee numbers in the U.S. had already fallen so low that for the first time in 80 years, bees had to be imported from abroad. Government officials turned to Australia, where a lucrative bee export industry now regularly ships to the U.S. With the onset of colony collapse disorder, beekeepers desperately rebuild their empty hives with Australian bees. It's a quick fix, but only adds to the cost of the losses. These losses this year translates into about $450,000 uh, cost to put bees back in the boxes, 
lost pollination condor on bees, uh, lost honey crops. I mean, there's no way that we're gonna be, get back into black this year. And, uh, you know, we just can't, we can't take another hit like this. Beekeepers facing bankruptcy. Farms without food. Desperate beekeepers turn to scientists to solve the mystery of colony collapse disorder before another round of bee losses throws agriculture into a tailspin. Diana Cox Foster of Penn State University has spent years studying bee diseases. In November 2006, she receives a frantic phone call from beekeeper David Hackenberg. Dave Hackenberg called me and said, all my bees are dying, and there were no bees inside the colonies or out on the ground. And he had a few colonies that were still in a state of decline, so we went up and picked him up from him to begin looking at this. Dr. Cox Foster quickly assembles a working group of scientists and bee researchers to investigate the growing epidemic. She enlists the help of top researchers in every field, toxicology, biology, and even human disease. Columbia University's Infectious Disease Lab is the top human pathogen research center in the country. The lab conducts groundbreaking research on human diseases like West Nile virus, SARS, and encephalitis. Dr. Cox Foster convinces the team to apply their expertise to insects for the first time. Diane is very persuasive. What she told me was that there are over 90 crops that depend on bees for pollination. So whereas I typically think of bees only in, as producers of honey, they're important for nuts and fruits. I was actually quite naive. And I also became intrigued by the notion that something had appeared as an emerging disease. The team begins by testing samples of bees from CCD hives. They analyze the DNA and comb through the results, separating the bee DNA from any pathogens or infectious organisms that might be living inside the bee. And the first question we ask is, is this something which is a piece of bee DNA or is it something that's non-bee DNA? If it's non-bee DNA, then it's a candidate for being an important finding. We're searching for any kind of pathogen that could possibly be causing colony collapse disorder. And if the virus is present, then we'll try to sequence that virus in full to see if it's a new species of an existing virus or whether it's a no an already known virus. The first samples reveal a startling discovery. Bees aren't suffering from one disease, but a staggering number of afflictions. They quickly realize that pinpointing a single culprit won't be easy. We have found a whole potpourri of viruses and bacteria and fungi. Some of them have been in the United States for a long time, but that's not what we're trying to find. We're trying to find something which has been relatively recent in its introduction here and is going to be present only in those colonies that have been rigorously defined as CCD colonies. With such a long list of problems facing the honeybee, sorting through the possible suspects will require a number of creative tactics. Dennis Van Engelsdorp's approach is to open up the bees like a crime scene coroner. He starts by taking samples from his CCD hives. Dennis and his team conduct forensic autopsies on up to 100 bees a day. Right from the beginning, they're stunned by what they discover. We started looking at the guts of the bees, and we started seeing all this really gross pathology, all this different scar tissue, and we realized we didn't know what any of it meant. We found some bees where there were whole pollen grains, so it was obviously not digested, so it was like they just kept eating and eating because they weren't getting any nutrition some where we found all these white packets in their digestive system. So there was just this whole array of things and we had no idea what it meant. The investigations lead to another stunning revelation. Fungi growing in the bee's tissue 
are similar to samples found in humans with suppressed immune systems. It could be that bees have been weakened by an insect virus similar to AIDS. We've talked about this condition being somewhat like AIDS in the sense that it, it seems clear that the immune response has been suppressed in these bees. Whether it's an organism like a virus that's causing it, or whether it's uh, different stresses like a nutritional stress, or whether it's a chemical stress like the pesticides that causes this immune, that's what we're still investigating. Pesticides are another key suspect in the CCD investigation. And one country in Europe provides a perfect case study into how bees are affected by these controversial chemicals. Pesticides have erupted as a national issue in France, where bees and beekeeping have a long and treasured history. In Paris, beehives can be found throughout the city parks. And beekeeper Jean Pocton keeps his hives at the most prestigious address in town, the rooftop of the Paris Opera. Jean believes his big city bees fare better than their countryside counterparts. Beehives live better in cities because here the trees and flowers are protected, meaning they don't use any pesticides at all. The French battle over pesticides began in the early 90s when farmers used a new brand of pesticides called neonicotinoids. The chemicals contained neurotoxins and were sprayed as a treatment for sunflower seeds a favorite source of pollen for honeybees. Not long afterward, the bees began to disappear. The French government banned the chemical, but even after the ban, bee numbers continued to fall. Toxicologist Axel de Courty is investigating whether pesticides are to blame for the mystery of France's bee losses. Here is a cage that was exposed to a strong dose of the product. We gave them a syrup that contained a strong dose of the pesticide. They ate all the syrup, and here, three hours after, we already have some clear symptoms of poisoning. Tests reveal that pesticides can cause the same symptoms witnessed in bees affected by CCD. Loss of appetite, memory loss, disorientation. But he maintains this isn't enough to explain France's dying bees. After several years of studying this product, we've arrived at the conclusion that the cause is because of many factors. That is to say that the pesticide is highly toxic to bees, that bees could be exposed in weak doses, but the depopulation is probably increased by another factor. Back at Penn State University, the CCD working group is investigating whether pesticides are finding their way inside the hives. Marianne Frazier is conducting a study on how bees are affected by chemicals in the environment. She's researching whether the new, more toxic pesticides can explain why the bees fail to return to their hives. We know from some work that's been done in France that these things can impair behavior of bees, particularly their ability to learn. If these pesticides impact their ability to learn, it's totally possible that these bees can't find their way back home. After setting colonies of bees in fields where chemicals have been sprayed, Marianne collects pollen samples from the hive. The tests reveal disturbing results. The pollen is loaded with over 40 different chemicals. 
What we are afraid of is that these pesticides are breaking down the bee's immune system so that if a pathogen were present, is it causing the bees to truly succumb to that pathogen because the immune system has been impacted in a negative way. Studies have proven that many pesticides are highly toxic to bees. But even in areas where no pesticides are sprayed, bees are still disappearing. We have people who are losing bees from CCD who aren't anywhere near any sprays. We have organic beekeepers losing bees. So certainly insecticides probably play a role in colony mortality, but I, I, I don't think we're going to find that insecticides are the cause of CCD. However the chemicals may affect the bees, what they bring back to the hive affects us as well. The nectar they gather often ends up on our plates as the bees' signature product, honey. In France, honey is an esteemed tradition. And in the south, the lavender flowers of Provence provide bees with material to make one of the world's most prized honeys, Miel de Lavande. Every July, the hills are blanketed with rows of brilliant lavender. Beekeepers bring their honeybees to gorge themselves on the fragrant nectar and to harvest the lavender honey they produce as a result. Bees store the nectar they've collected by regurgitating it with enzyme-rich saliva into storage cells. Worker bees fan the cells to evaporate water content, and when the honey is ripened, they seal it over with wax. Humans have been harvesting honey for at least 6,000 years. Ancient Egyptians ferried beehives up and down the Nile. And our age-old love affair with the bees' liquid gold is even depicted in mules in prehistoric caves. One of nature's wonders, honey is antibacterial. And as a result, it never spoils. The amount of honey a hive produces is a sign of the colony's strength. But low honey yield can signal that bees are suffering from another condition that some scientists say opens the door to colony collapse disorder, malnutrition. Andalusia, Spain. Spain has the highest number of commercial beekeepers in Europe, with the most businesses at risk from CCD. In 2006, Spain was hit hard when hundreds of thousands of hives mysteriously disappeared. This year, the situation has improved, but beekeepers are still shaken from last year's losses. Bees are important because, for example, in this part, 70% of the plants are pollinated. If the bees disappear, then the 70% of these plants that need pollination won't be here. At the University of Córdoba, malnutrition is one of the main suspects under investigation. Scientists here are studying whether poor nutrition in bees can lead to CCD. They believe bees forced to pollinate on large monoculture farms could be weakened by a single crop diet. It would be as if we had a pet, a dog for example, and we fed him exclusively bread. That dog would develop a deficiency disease. This is the same thing the bees are experiencing. The group also targets another theory, that a single-celled parasite called Nosema serrani is the infectious agent behind CCD. The lab discovers an epidemic of Nosema. Every hive they sample tests positive for the parasite. They believe this is exactly why Nosema is not the cause of CCD. Si Nosema serrana if Nosema is present in all hives, in all of Spain's hives, 
Why are we not having any problems this year? I wish it were that easy. I wish the colony collapse were due to a parasite, because removing that parasite would solve the problem. But it's not always that simple when dealing with nature. The Spanish team doesn't believe the CCD investigation will isolate a single cause of the outbreak. They contend that a whole conspiracy of forces, from pesticides to parasites to poor nutrition, have created a perfect storm, weakening the bees, leaving them vulnerable to infection. The bees may be in even greater danger than scientists previously thought. Governments around the world joined the investigation, channeling emergency funds into efforts to crack the case. But while beekeepers continue to sound the alarm, some governments claim it's business as usual. London, England. As CCD wipes out hives across the US and Europe, beekeepers here discover that their bees too have vanished. Normally you give the hive a little tap and you get a bit of a sound that you know that the bees are all right because it's winter so they don't come out and nothing happened. So then that's when I opened the hives and discovered no bees. Others in England have been warning that bees have been in trouble for some time. I don't think there is any doubt that major losses of bees have occurred over recent years in a number of different countries around the world. Whether they all actually have the same underlying cause is something that only research can say. And in this country, uh, all we can say is that a number of beekeepers have lost a lot of their colonies in uh, the last year. Despite the disappearance of the London bees, the UK government remains adamant that CCD has not reached Britain's shores. We do not think that CCD is an issue in the UK yet. The winter bee losses do seem to be rising very slowly on average, which is something that needs to be monitored carefully. I do not consider that we have seen any unusual bee losses in the last two years. Beekeepers in London claim the government isn't doing enough to address the problem of the vanishing bees. Bees. You know, they're only a little insect, they're not worried about them. They'll only worry when it's too late. For many people around the world, the potential impact of colony collapse disorder is difficult to fathom. The loss of fruits, vegetables, even forage crops essential for meat and dairy cattle. Basically, flowering plants evolve with bees, and so they need each other in order to survive. So without bees or any of the insect pollinators, you won't get any fruits and you won't get any vegetables. What you'll be left with are all the plants that are wind pollinated, unless you can hire hundreds of thousands of people to, to hand pollinate these crops. Humans playing the role of honeybee. It seems an impossible scenario from a dark future. Yet there is one place where the future is now. Beijing, China. In China, bees are big business. And if the bees make it, China exports it. Honey, wax, venom, bee pollen. Even a protein-rich compound called royal jelly that bees feed to their larvae. All is harvested and packaged for human consumption. China exports 90% of the world's royal jelly, 13,000 tons a year. Most ends up in skin creams and health products. But some royal jelly makes its way to beekeepers in the U.S., who feed it to larvae in breeding operations. China may be the king of bee products, but there is one region where the bees have already disappeared. Southern Sichuan province. 
In the rural county of Hanyuan, pears are the local calling. Pear orchards carpet the mountains down to the foot of the valley. And in the center of town, the pear goddess bestows an eternal blessing on the yearly harvests. It seems to work. Hanyuan produces 80% of the pears in the region. Each year in August, the trees hang heavy with fruit, individually wrapped before harvest to protect it from insects. A typical family will harvest around five tons of pears. But it isn't bees farmers have to thank for the abundant crop. The bees here disappeared long ago. In the early 1980s, uncontrolled use of pesticides wiped out the local bee population and killed off the pollinating plants that feed them. Fruit production plummeted, and local farmers watched their livelihood vanish before their eyes. I wrote a letter to Beijing, and they wrote back and said, you have to hand pollinate, because the insects used to do it, but they've been killed off by pesticides. So now, you have to do it. Now, each year in April, farmers must play the role of honeybee. And it's not as easy as the bees make it look. They start by collecting and preparing the pollen by hand. They scrub the anthers, the male part of the flower, for their pollen, and dry it for up to two days. When the pollen is ready, the human pollinators go to work. Dr. Tang Ya from Sichuan University has been studying the pollination process used by farmers in Hanyuan. Today, he has come to see the fruits of their labor. When I first heard about this, I didn't believe it. This is work normally done by nature, by bees. With nothing more than a stick of bamboo and some chicken feathers, farmer Kao Xingyuan conjures up the fuzzy body of a bee. With a dip of pollen, a light touch is just enough to pollinate the blossoms. Every spring, hundreds of workers take to the trees and pollinate the pear flowers, blossom by blossom. A hive of bees can pollinate up to three million flowers in a single day. A human can only pollinate up to 30 trees. It's a painstaking and expensive substitute for a service that bees once provided for free. I wish it would go back to the natural state. I wish the bees would come back, because this is a really difficult situation for us. To replace honeybees with human pollinators in the United States would cost more than $90 billion a year. And even here, in Hanyuan, hand pollination may not be sustainable for long. For the farmers doing hand pollination, it's still feasible. But now, China is changing very fast. Most of the young people are heading to the city. I think in not such a long time, 10 to 20 years, hand pollination will be very difficult. Hanyuan's story provides a glimpse into a frightening future without bees. 
and a reminder of how irreplaceable the honeybee really is. There's no artificial substitute for pollination, nor is there any concerted effort to even develop one. People have tried here and there to find substitutes for animal pollinators, wind machines, and certain sorts of vibrating devices for greenhouse use, but nothing, nothing works like a bee. The stakes couldn't be higher for scientists looking for the cause of CCD. And back in New York, less than eight months into the investigation, the CCD working group has had a breakthrough. DNA tests have isolated a single suspect, a virus found in nearly all of the CCD hives. It's a virus that until now was found only in Israel, called IAPV, Israeli Acute Paralysis Virus. The group believes they've found the culprit. The team now turns to the more difficult question. How did the virus get to the United States? All test results seem to point to one likely source. Australia. Researchers and bee enthusiasts from around the world gather at the annual Apomondia Bee Conference. But this year, a shadow hangs over the festivities. The CCD working group has just announced their findings, that colony collapse disorder may have been triggered by a virus found in Australian bees. Dr. Jeff Pettis from the U.S. Department of Agriculture has come to address the issue of CCD. Good afternoon. And the breaking news has made the topic especially sensitive. Dr. Pettis explains how the virus was discovered, and Australian bee exporters are understandably nervous. We found this particular virus in packaged bees which had come into the U.S. from Australia, and we sampled those bees before they were actually introduced into the U.S. bees, and into U.S. colonies, so we sampled them right out of the packages. He hopes to calm any fears by reiterating that the findings are far from conclusive. We still have a combination of factors going on, and this particular virus may be an, just an indicator of that, or it could be acting as a pathogen, but we need to find out. Dr. Pettis says it's still too early to say where exactly the virus originated. Where did the virus come from? One thing that gets missed is that we found this particular virus in royal jelly from China as well, but we cite it as being present in the US, Australian bees, and royal jelly from China. So the question of where it's come from and, and where, you know, who had it first, that's really unanswered at this time. Scientists will now begin working to understand the virus and to develop a way to fight it. One plan is to use aggressive Africanized bees to engineer a new breed of super bee, resistant to all kinds of disease. Africanized bees appear to be very resistant to these viruses as a whole. So if we could select those traits that give them that resistance, put it in our nice docile bees, get rid of the de defensiveness that those bees have, we could have a, maybe a much stronger strain of bee. Whatever methods they develop to fight the virus, scientists stress that bees are up against more than a single threat. There's something more going on here than just this virus. This virus may be the cause of CCD or even a sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. If CCD is caused by a combination of factors, this may be the one that pushes them over the edge. But certainly this virus alone is not the reason why worldwide we're having a decline of pollinators. Honeybees still have problems. If we find a cure for whatever the virus is, it doesn't necessarily mean that the honeybee uh, populations will recover. They still have many other uh, stresses to deal with. Although the bee's future is uncertain, colony collapse disorder has ensured that this extraordinary animal will no longer be taken for granted. What CCD has done is it's highlighted the fact that bees are in trouble. But there are a lot of bees dying every year, and they've been dying for 20 or 30 years like this. And we need to address that issue of bee health. 
If there's anything good that could come out of colony collapse disorder, first is having the attention by the media and the public on the problem here. The people beginning to realize how important bees and pollinators are. Beekeepers anxiously wait to see if this winter, almost a year after it first appeared, CCD will strike again. They emphasize that we have never had more at stake. We're scared to death because one third of all the food we put in our mouths is put there by honey. So in a long term effect, it could be a very damaging thing to our whole you know, way of survival. Honeybees pollinate all those foods that nutritionists are exhorting us to increase our consumption of. It's the fruits, nuts, and vegetables. We'll still have bread, but all the color and vitality will be much harder to get and much more expensive. We need to be prepared to eat gruel without anything else if we don't have any of these pollinators. I think we should be concerned as a world about what's happening. People are saying, well, we could get by eating wheat and corn and that. But yes, but that we would lose everything else that makes life so special. This nature program is a